Okay, so I'd now like to introduce our presenters today, starting with Dr. Brian Brigman. He is an orthopedic tumor surgeon at Duke University with more than 20 years of experience treating benign and malignant tumors of the bone and soft tissue, including TGCT. He completed his medical school at the University of North Carolina and an orthopedic surgery residency at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. His PhD was completed at Creighton University and a fellowship in orthopedic oncology at Massachusetts General Hospital and Boston Children's Hospital. He now leads the Duke Sarcoma Center of the Duke Cancer Institute. Dr. Wagner um, is an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Washington and an assistant professor um, in the clinical research division at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. He is the director of sarcoma clinical research. And after graduating from Harvard University with a medical degree, Dr. Wagner completed his residency at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York and medical oncology fellowship at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. Wagner has received numerous awards, including the Conquer Cancer Foundation of ASCO Young Investigator Award and Quad W Foundation of the American Association of Cancer Research Fellowship for clinical and translational research for his research on sarcoma. Dr. Wagner has been in his current position in Seattle since 2017. And lastly, Dr. Wilkie is a sarcoma medical oncologist and a clinical trialist with research interest in immunotherapies, targeted therapies, precision medicine, and early phase drug development. She is an associate professor and director of the sarcoma program at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and is a member of the phase one and experimental molecular therapeutics research program as the deputy associate director of clinical research for the University of Colorado Cancer Center. She leads the investigation initiated clinical trials committee to help advance novel research to clinic. Her research and laboratory studies um, the tumor and immune microenvironment of sarcoma to identify new drugs and boost the immune system for further clinical trials. So I'll let Dr. Brian Brigman walk us through uh, a brief overview of the surgical landscape of this treatment. And then Dr. Uh, Wagner will take over with the systemic treatment and Dr. Wilkie will finish with the new kind of innovator updated information on the systemic treatment and we'll open for questions. So Dr. Brigman. Great. Well, thank uh, you, Sydney, and thank all of you for joining us um, to learn a little bit about uh, tenosynovial giant cell tumor. Um, as was mentioned, I'm a surgeon, uh, so you're going to get um, a little bit different uh, uh, um, experience than our other two panelists who are both uh, medical oncologists. Um, as surgeons, we tend to see these patients when they start their journey, uh, so I think it's appropriate that I talk a little bit about um, the background of this disease and how it presents and, and a little bit about surgery. So what is uh, tenosynovial giant cell tumor? Well, it is, a, uh, it is a tumor that affects joints or tendon sheaths for a long time. We didn't know if this was an inflammatory condition or a neoplasm. It's now clear that it is a neoplasm, but a very small minority of the cells in the tumor are actually uh, the neoplastic cells. The rest are kind of a reaction, an inflammatory reaction. It is benign. It's not a malignancy. Uh, as mentioned, it's a tumor that involves joints or tendon sheaths. Those are the, the, the uh, kind of tubes that tendons run in. And previously, this was known by a couple of different names. Uh, when it was in a joint, uh, like a knee joint, we called it pigmented villanodular synovitis or PVNS. And when it was in a tendon sheath, we called it a giant cell tumor of tendon sheath. Uh, as we realized the cells uh, behind this, we realized that these were actually the same uh, disease. So now we it goes by tenosynovial giant cell tumor. When you look at it grossly, if you if you saw if somebody showed you a, a piece of this that came out of their knee, it would look like a piece of brown tissue. That brown is from the hemosiderin or iron that's uh, that's in these in these tumors. There are a couple of different types of tenosynovial giant cell tumor, and this is really important uh, as we talk about the treatment for this disease. It can exist as a, as a localized nodular uh, disease. Uh, so on the, um, the pictures on your right side and the, the top left picture shows a, a view of a knee uh, on an MRI from the side. This, uh, the arrow is pointing at a little a black round spot. That is a focus of 
of nodular tenosynovial giant cell tumor. If you uh, look at the picture to the right, you'd see what that would look like uh, grossly, although it's really magnified there. I'm gonna make it look more like what it would look like uh, when you see it uh, coming out of the joint. The pictures on the bottom show diffuse disease and diffuse disease is, uh, is a very different animal than that localized uh, disease. It, is, uh, it will fill up a joint. It can be uh, more destructive to cartilage and bone. It's more uh, uh, likely to lead to arthritis. Uh, and it is less common. Um, and it, uh, it will, as, as I mentioned, kind of fill up, uh, fill up a joint with this kind of raggedy shag carpet looking stuff. You're going to hear a lot about uh, CSF1 or colony stimulating factor one. Uh, um, the tumor cells in tenosynovial giant cell tumor make this CSF1, and it recruits this inflammatory environment around uh, the cells, and it also feeds back to kind of keep these cells uh, going. You'll hear a lot more from it by the two other presenters who are much smarter than I, so I'm going to I'm going to uh, leave that. Um, Let's talk a little bit about how patients show up. What, what, uh, how do patients know they have something going on? Well, they usually present with pain, swelling, stiffness in a joint. Uh, tenosynovial giant cell tumor affects a joint. It doesn't affect multiple joints. Um, uh, as you see in the skeleton on your left, the, the where it happens is a little bit, I'm sorry, the skeleton on your right, the where it happens is a little bit different when you compare the localized tenosynovial giant cell tumor to the diffuse disease. Um, the localized disease shows up more commonly in the hands, and that's typically this, uh, this uh, what we used to call uh, uh, giant cell tumor of tendon sheath. Uh, both of them are most common in the knee, but the diffuse, uh, the diffuse disease is much more common in the knee. It can happen in any joint. Uh, if you aspirate a joint, if you stick a needle into a, a joint that has uh, diffuse PVNS, you, you, you'll aspirate the stuff that looks like uh, old motor oil. It's thick and dark, um, and that's, that's fairly characteristic of tenosynovial giant cell tumor. Other things can present also, though, with a single uh, swollen joint. Um, so not every, not every time somebody has a, a, a swollen joint is it a tenosynovial giant cell tumor. Uh, some forms of rheumatoid arthritis, infections, other benign tumors like synovial chondromatosis or other intraarticular processes can look uh, present in a similar fashion. How do we treat tenosynovial giant cell tumor? Well, there are people who, who present with asymptomatic lesions, somebody who, uh, uh, an athlete who hurts their knee on the, on the soccer field, for example, on an MRI shows an incidental finding of a, uh, of a small nodule of, uh, of localized uh, tenosynovial giant cell tumor. Those patients can be watched over time if they are asymptomatic. Um, usually when patients come to us, they are having symptoms. That's the reason they've come. And, and surgery has been uh, the standard of care. That surgery can be arthroscopic or open. Um, the success rate of surgery really depends on... Uh, on uh, on what um, uh, kind what, whether it's the localized disease or diffuse disease, and we'll talk more about that in the next slide. Um, arthroscopic surgery or open surgery can be done, as I mentioned. Radiation uh, was done more in the past for this disease. It's rarely done now due to the complications associated with radiation. I did see a patient earlier today who was previously irradiated for their tenosynovial giant cell tumor in the '90s, though. So it does occasionally happen. And then systemic therapy, which you'll hear about uh, a little bit later uh, from our other presenters. So when we do operate on tenosynovial giant cell tumor, our goal is to remove all the disease. And as you, if you, if you remember back to that picture of that diffuse disease that uh, kind of filled up a joint, that can be really, really difficult. It can be difficult even with nodular disease, although we're, we're much more successful. When folks have that localized disease, the chance of it coming back in the joints uh, low, it's less than 10%. When we, uh, when we, when folks have this more diffuse disease, the chance of coming back has been reported around 40%. I think it's probably actually even higher than that. People will often ask, well, should I have arthroscopic surgery or open surgery? And the truth is it, it, it probably doesn't matter. This data, this uh, Kaplan-Meier uh, uh, curve, so uh, shows uh, a comparison of arthroscopic surgery, which is the blue, 
versus open surgery, which is the red over a 10 year time period. That's on the bottom uh, scale. The, 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 the vertical scale is the percentage of patients who don't have a recurrence. So if you look over time, there's really no statistical difference between these two curves. That is the patients, this is all folks with diffuse disease. Uh, they had local recurrences at the same rate and at around 10 years, about 40% uh, of them uh, were left without disease, uh, with, uh, with disease. This curve is very different if we, uh, if we look at patients who've already had recurrent disease. So if you say, uh, I've got, I, I had uh, diffuse uh, tenosynovial giant cell tumor in my knee and it recurred, uh, is it still a 40% chance it will recur with the next surgery? Well, the answer is no, it's not. This, this is, this is uh, the same kind of curve uh, uh, comparing folks who have, are having their first surgery, those are the folks in red, compared to folks who are having surgery for recurrent disease, their second surgery or later in blue. And you'll see the local recurrence rate is much, much higher if it's already recurred once. And only about 10% uh, of these patients are able to have uh, longstanding, uh, disease, uh, 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 longstanding absence of disease in their, in their joint over time. So these are the patients, again, who uh, uh, our new systemic therapies are really a, uh, a, uh, a, a, a good option in. And we'll hear more about, again, that uh, more about those patients and, and this uh, treatment by the next presenters. So I think that's all, that's all I have for uh, kind of background and surgery. And again, we'll answer more questions later. Uh, Dr. Wagner, if you would like to share your screen. Thank you, Dr. Bergman. Dr. Wagner, you're in presenter view. Perfect. You are also muted. All right, can you hear me now? Yep. Ah, sorry about that. All right, so uh, thank you, Dr. Brigman, uh, for the introduction and uh, talking about the surgical aspects of uh, TGCT. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the history, the brief history of systemic treatment for this disease, um, where we now have, as most of you probably know, an approved drug uh, for treating tenosynovial giant cell tumor. And the sort of rationale for that is uh, by targeting that protein that Dr. Bregman mentioned, CSF1R. Um, so these are, first, these are my disclosures. Just one sort of relevant one. So Decifera actually has a drug that they're studying for this disease. Um, so first, so you know, why do these drugs potentially even work for tenosynovial giant cell tumor? And what makes these uh, sort of abnormal cells grow? So most of these tumors have a fusion of the chromosomes that puts two genes together that aren't supposed to be together in a normal cell. And one of those genes is CSF1, which uh, results in a significantly more amount of that particular protein than the cell 
would normally have. And that's a protein that's very important in regulating inflammation, and especially the white blood cells or the immune cells called macrophages. And when there's extra copies of that gene, it creates an inflammatory environment, which then leads to the symptoms and the abnormal growth of these uh, cells. And CSF1 is a protein that kind of just floats around, but then it can bind to a different protein called CSF1R, which is the receptor um, for that one where there's lots and lots of copies. And the rationale for the drugs targeting this particular pathway is to interrupt that uh, connection between CSF1 and CSF1R. And that biology has been understood for you know, almost 20 years or so now. Um, and once that was recognized, then people realized, well, we can actually use drugs that block that protein-protein interaction and potentially uh, improve uh, the symptoms or ideally even shrink the tenosynovial giant cell tumors in patients. And one of the first drugs that actually blocks that protein is a medicine called imatinib. And that was developed uh, about 20, 25 years ago for a different type of cancer, so uh, CML or a type of leukemia. And it very quickly was realized that it can also be used to treat a different type of sarcoma called gastrointestinal stromal tumor. And that's because it blocks a protein called KIT or KIT. But it's not specific for that protein. It also just incidentally happens to block CSF1R. Um, it doesn't block it super well, um, but it does so enough that it was worth studying. And when patients with tenosynovial giant cell tumor were treated with that medicine, imatinib, um, there were some patients who actually had really exceptional responses. Um, so on the left, those bars there, so the patients starting out on the treatment were at this vertical line. And then if the bar goes up, that means their uh, tumor or their tenosynovial giant cell tumor got bigger. And if it goes down, that means it got smaller. And on the far right of that chart, you can see that there were some patients who really actually had exceptional responses. Um, but it was a relatively small uh, percent of people. Um, but what was also noticed was that even if the tumors didn't really dramatically change in size, patient symptoms actually uh, improved at a much higher likelihood. So of the 22 patients who had uh, reported uh, more formalized symptom information, 16 of them reported that their symptoms improved while being on the drug. That's over 70%. Um, and then from that data, so now many other drugs have been developed. Another one is called nilotinib, which is another uh, drug similar to imatinib that blocks a number of different proteins. Among them is CSF1R. And another study was done looking at uh, nilotinib. And a couple of points from that study are first is after just one year of treatment, uh, a little more than half of people continued still on the drug uh, because they were uh, benefiting or not worsening. Um, and if you look at that similar type of chart that I showed on the last slide, um, still there were a very small number of patients who had their tumors actually uh, significantly shrink, where only 6% uh, of patients uh, had what we would in the oncology world call a response. But there were a large number of people who had just a slight reduction in their uh, tumor size and uh, some people whose tumors just got bigger in spite of treatment. Um, but these drugs, so both imatinib and nilotinib, block a lot of different proteins. Uh, neither of them were actually developed to specifically block CSF1R. So then people got thinking, well, how can we actually block that protein uh, more efficiently and in a better way? And um, there was a actually pretty uh, remarkable effort where a drug was designed uh, specifically to block CSF1R. And what this picture shows, so on the top, um, 
of that diagram is the actual drug. So that's the chemical structure of it. And the picture uh, shows the drug actually binding to the part of the CSF1R protein that it was designed to target. And it fits very nicely in that pocket and uh, blocks it more efficiently than the imatinib or the nilotinib. And uh, that drug now we, we call pexidartinib, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And it was tested initially in a relatively small number of patients. And most of those patients actually had very impressive reduction in tumor size. And the reduction lasted for, uh, in some cases, well over a year. Uh, and that you can see on this graph on the left. On the right is a series of MRI uh, pictures where that's actually the same uh, patient. And you can see the tumor or the tenosynovial giant cell tumor outlined um, all the way on the left on the baseline picture. And then the next one over to the right is two months after treatment and then four months after treatment. And you can see that treatment with pexidartinib led to a decrease in the size of that tenosynovial giant cell tumor. And then because of this initial data, more patients were put on study. And uh, this is another way of looking at that similar type of data where each of these lines represents a patient who was treated with pexidartinib. And all of those lines in, yellow, uh, in orange are patients who, at least at the time this paper was written, were continuing on the drug and each one of those who had a star had what we would consider a significant reduction in the uh, tumor size of their tenosynovial giant cell tumor. And that was very encouraging. So this was first reported in 2015. Um, and uh, of course was very exciting to see. And because of that, a much larger clinical trial was done where patients with tenosynovial giant cell tumor who were not considered good candidates for surgery were given either pexidartinib, so the active drug, or a placebo. And uh, what that showed was that sort of as expected, the group who got pexidartinib had really impressive reduction in tumor size, uh, where not a single patient had what was technically considered a response. So no one's tumor shrunk by more than 30% uh, on the placebo group. Um, if you actually look at that curve on the right, so those are the tumor size changes from the patients who were treated with the placebo. And some of them did go down, um, but uh, not nearly as much as the patients who were treated with the active drug. And then if we actually calculate that response in a different way, so um, these charts are looking just at the two-dimensional change on one uh, picture from the image, uh, from the MRI. Um, but if we actually try and calculate the volume of the tumor, then the responses that we were seeing with pexidartinib were even more dramatic and even more patients seem to have really excellent responses. And now a number of studies have been done looking at pexidartinib for treatment of tenosynovial giant cell tumor. And because a number of studies have been done, we have some longer term results uh, and more patients to, uh, to guide us and to inform uh, sort of what our expectations are. And what we see is that by pooling at least three different trials with longer uh, duration of treatment, so if you can stay on the pexidartinib for uh, a year or sometimes even more, then there's actually a higher likelihood of having that tumor continue to shrink. Um, but all of this comes at the cost of toxicity. So pexidartinib, even though it led to those really dramatic responses in some patients actually had really significant uh, in a small number of people, life-threatening toxicity. Um, really one of the big ones is liver toxicity where uh, many patients had some level of liver toxicity and we watch it very closely, but uh, a very small number of people had uh, elevations in bilirubin and actually an impairment of their liver function, um, which 
uh, is a life-threatening condition. And because of that, we now monitor patients on pexidartinib very closely. Um, and anyone who prescribes it has to actually participate in a program called a REMS program, which is a specialized, uh, very highly regulated type of program where we have to do training and uh, register and uh, assert that we monitor liver functions by a predetermined uh, schedule. Um, other less uh, severe toxicities, but one that's very common and uh, and relevant uh, is it changes people's hair color. So lots of people will develop white hair on pexidartinib. And then also fatigue uh, is uh, the other very common toxicity that people report and that was seen on those clinical trials. Um, so how can we improve on that? We now have a drug that actually works very well for this disease, but uh, comes with some risks. And really, you know, one thing, if we can reduce the toxicity, then that, of course, would be preferred. Um, are there other ways of delivering the drug? So because this is not the sort of tumor that will commonly spread and require treatment across all of the body, are there ways that we can actually do, for example, a joint injection to just locally deliver the, the active drug? Um, we don't really know what's the optimal duration of treatment. So how long should people stay on pexidartinib, especially if it's working? Um, so if someone's relatively young and gets started on it, uh, we don't have information really on the long-term potential side effects. Um, and if it stopped after a few years, does that mean you, know, you can just continue holding it? Um, we still have to sort of learn that information. Um, and then also, when should it be given? Should it potentially be given before a surgery? Would it help facilitate a surgery and uh, help the surgeons be able to more effectively remove all of the tumor? Um, and uh, to try and answer some of these questions, there's lots of clinical trials that are ongoing, and uh, we still have a lot to learn, but we've also made significant progress over the years. Um, so uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk, and I'll uh, hand it off to Dr. Wilkie. All right, thank you so much. That was a beautiful segue into the clinical trials piece. So let me see if I can manage to share my screen. Um, let's see. Somebody let Doris in the waiting room. <laughs> that looks perfect on our end. <laughs> okay, let me get rid of that then. All right, beautiful. So again, thanks to everybody for, for the invitation to speak with you all today and great talks um, from my colleagues and really set me up nicely to kind of give you the latest and greatest on ongoing clinical trials. So again, I'm just going to give some snapshots of the studies that are out there, and then um, I'll kind of highlight some of the background data, which many of you might not have necessarily seen in one place to kind of tell us how we got to the studies um, when it's available. Not all studies have it. And then at the end, I'll just mention a, a few things to think about as you're looking uh, for potential clinical trials or thinking about whether or not a patient's a good candidate for a clinical trial. All right. Uh, let's see. Okay, so study number one. Um, I will disclose also, like Dr. Wagner, I um, I am a trial investigator for the Decipera drug, and I do consult for them. So we'll start talking with, about that one first. So um, many of you have probably heard about this drug. Um, this is called uh, DCC3014 back in the day, and the new name is Vemseltinib. And this is a pill. So this is an oral CSF1 receptor inhibitor. Um, and basically they still have the original phase two open for patients who have had prior pexidartinib. So for example, patients who had pexy and had to stop for side effects or potentially um, the drug stopped working, um, there still is a way to get patients onto this drug through that pathway. But the big famous trial and the one that's going on right now is called the MOTION trial. Um, this is a phase three trial that is open for patients with no prior uh, treatment with um, a CSF1 directed therapy. So that means if you've had PEXI, you would not be eligible for this trial. Um, the current dose is twice weekly um, with pills. Again, as I mentioned, it is placebo randomized. So that means a computer assigns you to either start with placebo or start with active drug. And you don't know, the docs don't know, no one knows except the pharmacy making it for you, but it's only for 24 weeks. Um, at that point, at, which is basically six months, you are then 
unblinded, which means you figure out if you were getting placebo, sugar pill, or the active drug. And if you were on placebo, you have the option um, to then cross over and get the active drug. So it's sort of one of these things, it's hard for people to, to wrap their head around, but at least there is that opportunity. To be eligible for the trial, surgery has to be considered a, not a good option um, through a tumor board discussion. Um, and you need to have moderately symptomatic disease. So this is unfortunately for patients who have minimal symptoms or swelling, probably not the, not the best option. Um, you can have had prior Gleevec or imatinib, um, but again, no prior CSF1 treatments. And so many of you have probably seen this data, but this is the latest and greatest update. This is from the phase one, two um, that was presented at the European um, cancer meeting um, in 2021. So this is small and I'll kind of walk you through it. But basically what this shows, each bar is a patient who was on these various treatment groups and how long they were able to stay on, this, on the treatment um, and then what happened to them. If they're ongoing, they have a little triangle. Um, if they're still stable, they have a little circle and so on. So you can see by months on treatment, um, people stay on this for, for quite a long time. Um, and then this is sort of the, the more updated phase two study um, that's still ongoing. Uh, most patients are still receiving therapy. So this is a little early. Um, but what's cool to look at, this is what's called the waterfall plot. So the, just like what Dr. Wagner showed, each bar represents a patient and what happened to their disease. So if the bar is going down, that means the, the tumor dimension decreased by a certain percentage. If it were to be going up, it would be increasing. So you can see that across the board, um, essentially all the patients in phase one and phase two were either stable or had a decrease in their tumor. And it comes out to, again, about 40% of patients having that magic 30% decrease, which is a pretty significant decrease in this disease. Um, so overall, pretty promising. Um, the next trial I'll mention is a drug called emectuzumab. Don't try to say that too quickly. Um, this is an IV drug against um, CSF1 receptor. So this is an antibody that's designed to block it. Um, this trial is called the tangent trial and is about to open up. Um, this is an IV infusion every two weeks for five treatments, and then they observe you for three months. Again, there's a placebo uh, on this one, but it's two to one randomization, which means there's two out of three chances that you get the active drug. And the same thing, 24 weeks of being blinded and then the opportunity to cross over to open label. What's really cool about this is it's enrolling 12 and up. So for it's not commonly seen in children, but in adolescents, um, this could be a potential trial option, which is great. Again, you can't, you need to have high-risk disease and surgery. It shouldn't be an option to go on. Um, and you can have had PEXI, but it has to be at least three months before you go on study. The downside of this, and, and maybe my colleagues have heard more, at least right now, it looks like it's going to be pretty limited. Um, France is the lead on this study, um, but hopefully uh, there'll be an opportunity to expand a little bit more because of the data for this drug that I'm going to show you next. So this it was published um, in European Journal of Cancer. And again, this is our water plow, water plow, bleh, waterfall plots for the MRI responses. And you can, again, see in this study in the phase one, um, essentially everybody had at least some degree of decrease in their tumors um, looking really promising. And this is what's called the swimmer plot. So this each line here represents um, what happened to the change of the tumor size. So again, the same percentage change, but this is over time for the patient. So every line is a patient and you can kind of get a sense of, of how long these things are lasting. This is in study day. So we're out to like 800 days, which is almost three years for, you know, for some of these patients here. So again, long-term meaningful benefit um, across the board. So what about side effects? This is again, really, really small. So, um, you know, we heard a lot about the pexidartinib side effects. These drugs are, are different and, you know, they tend to cause um, similar toxicities, but it's slightly different than pexy. So things like swelling. So we see a lot of face swelling, a lot of body swelling around the eyes. Um, there's a significant amount of nausea, some fatigue, some diarrhea and skin changes. Um, the liver uh, issue is actually early. This is very early. So the, the way we were able to pick up the liver toxicity with PEXI is a, you, very, very small numbers of patients out of a lot of patients treated, not just with TGCT, but with solid cancers. Okay. And those patients may be sicker and all those things. 
So the hope is that these drugs, because of the way they're designed, may be safer for the liver, but we don't know that yet. Um, and we're talking again, just a handful of patients, but we haven't, knock on wood, um, in the phase ones, seen a whole lot of major liver toxicity here. So there's the hope that as we treat more patients on motion or this bigger study, the tangent study with the imactuzumab, um, that maybe we'll have um, an alternative slightly less risky for the liver, but all that remains to be seen. Oops. All right. And then there's just a couple others I'll just mention. This drug, um, ABSK021, again, oral pills against the CSF1 inhibitor or CSF1 receptor. Um, this is very early. This is a phase one trial that's at least listed on clinicaltrials.gov as being for all solid tumors. Again, um, I'm presuming TGCT is eligible, but I, we, I would want to confirm that. Um, this is currently only at MD Anderson based on the clinicaltrials.gov sheet. This is early. So the benefit is there's no placebo, um, but they are doing what's called dose escalation, which means you start at a baby dose, you put patients on, if they do well, then you go to the next dose and so on. So they're still trying to learn what the right dose is, what the side effects are, um, and how the drug is metabolized. So very, very early. And again, you can't have had prior CSF1 treatment. Um, the benefit here is that you don't need to have um, moderate disease or disease where surgery is not a possibility. Like that's not specified because again, it's sort of an early phase trial, but the risks of an unknown drug are, are obviously something you need to think about. Um, and then the other cool study is this um, different drug, AMB05X. Um, this is actually joint injections, again, an antibody to block the CSF1. So I couldn't find any formal data that's been presented yet, um, but there's a press release out there. And basically from the press release, and we would want to see the formal data, it does appear that um, the patients that have been treated had tumor reduction and benefit as far as pain and stiffness, quality of life. Um, and so there is a longer term phase two to start. This was literally only like eight to 12 patients, but this is going to have more patients here. Um, the treatment, you have to have one joint that's involved, which is the, the norm for most PBNS. Um, and you get an, an intra-articular or in the joint space injection once every four weeks for six injections. Got to have measurable tumor um, and then no prior uh, CSF1 uh, directed treatment. So if you've been on DCC or you've been on um, PEXI, you would not be eligible for this. And then last but not least, um, just a moment of silence for a drug that we're not really sure what's going to happen, but um, cabirolizumab, uh, I don't know if I said that right, uh, was a small phase two study um, that actually had some decent activity um, as well. Again, pretty similar to what we've seen. Unfortunately, this drug was sold from a company called Five Prime to Amgen. And so I haven't, I couldn't find, and I haven't heard um, about whether this will be developed further, but at least if you see this, um, again, more proof of concept that these drugs are effective um, for these diseases. So, and with that, I will stop and we can take questions. We have about 15 minutes um, and feel free to email or message me on Twitter or however you would like if you have more questions. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Wilkie. Um, so we will start with our first question, which I think is probably for Dr. Brigman. Um, so those recurrence rates that you were discussing, do they, are they lesser if you have a joint replacement or do those mimic the open versus arthroscopic recurrence rates? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the diffuse disease, uh, if, if left uh, alone long enough, will cause arthritis. It will cause joint destruction. A, um, and as part of the joint replacement, a synovectomy can be done. That's the surgery where we take out the lining of the joint. And, and probably we can do a little bit better synovectomy with a, uh, during a joint replacement because you're getting rid of some of the tissue in the way. But, uh, a, synovect uh, but a, a joint replacement does not cure PVNS. It does, it does get rid of the problem that PVNS causes, which is the arthritis. Uh, Tenosynovial giant cell tumors don't affect uh, cobalt, chrome, or plastic. So um, uh, you still may have effusions, swelling. You still may have stiffness, but you, you you're obviously not going to get arthritis after a, after a total joint. Thank you. Uh, for Dr. Wilkie and Dr. Wagner, do these CSF1 inhibitors, such as Tralia or any of the clinical trials, impact fertility long term? Does a matnib was also asked. That's a great question. So, um, so we have some pretty decent experience with imatinib just because it's been around a lot longer. Um, and in general, we we always tell people you don't want to get pregnant on imatinib. Um, but you know, for most people, 
unless you're sort of borderline as it is. So like I'm, I tell somebody, okay, if you're, you know, sort of borderline menopausal, so a woman who's sort of in her mid to late forties and still is thinking about fertility. I mean, that's that, you know, you may pass into that while you're on a mat nib and, and that might cause some issues. But for most people, we think that as long as you're off the drug, the fertility seems to be preserved. And it's very rare that we've seen long-term fertility issues um, after prior treatment with a mat nib. Now, the other drugs, um, there is mouse data, um, particularly for PEXI, because uh, this actually came up for a patient. There's mouse data that it may affect fertility. And so, you know, we have sent patients over for either sperm banking or at least counseling for fertility preservation. Again, we don't have a ton of experience with um, with some of this stuff. I mean, I don't I don't know how much long term follow up or if that was addressed in more so the longer PEXI data, but at least for um, the trials, that's something that we're monitoring and something that patients would be consented for. So it's it's just too early to know for some of these newer drugs. Mike, do you know if there was uh, if there was data on that in the PEXI long term paper? Uh, so I'm not sure about the long term fertility aspect, um, but I think that's one reason that the joint injections actually yeah. I would consider uh, to be a nice way to treat because at least in theory you're really giving high doses locally to the affected joint and questions like fertility where you know, even if there isn't long-term impact on fertility while you're on any of those drugs, we don't want you to get pregnant because there could be risk to a developing fetus. Um, but if you get a local injection, which is you know, right now only available on a clinical trial, but hopefully down the road, that's something that might help overcome that issue. So as many of us have heard and discussed that these tumors often have like a distinct coloring, right? You always kind of know it's kind of rusty. Um, is there any connections with systemic iron levels as well? Do patients just in general have more iron or is that unaffected by the staining per se of the tumors? No, it's it, 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 the, no, there's normal iron levels, and you, we can see other uh, other diseases where we see this color. Uh, any any anybody who has recurrent bleeds in their knee, so uh, recurrent hemarthroses will have this brown discoloration. It has more to do with just kind of the uh, the the bleeding in the knee. It's not it's not specific to this uh, entity, and doesn't have anything to do with systemic iron levels. Thank you very much. Um, so it's often talked about in these patient forums, if this disease is hereditary and it's quite known that it's not passed down, but what would cause maybe that extra or that switch in the chromosome, that translocation? Do we have any idea? Yeah, so I think, I mean, the most common thing is really just bad luck more than anything else. Um, you know, I wish we knew why anyone gets these mutations or chromosomal changes that lead to all sorts of different types of growths and cancers, but um, they they just sort of happen as we grow. And we have actually internal ways where our bodies try and prevent those things from happening, um, but, but clearly they're not perfect. And sometimes the mistakes can uh, sort of slip through and uh, eventually lead to growth like this. And I tell people not just with, with this, but with, you know, with any sarcoma, I mean, because everyone asks this question, oh my gosh, was it my injury that caused this? Like, you know, I have, and I do have a lot of young people who are athletes, right? Like how many runners or gymnast gymnasts do you see come in with these knee issues? Like, I, I feel like there's a lot of them, but that can't be the cause because otherwise there's a lot of people that get knee injuries. Dr. Brigham can tell us, right? I mean, you know, there's a lot of people that get knee injuries and not everybody has this super, super rare disease. So I think there's something that sets the stage, but it has to be a random thing, right? So maybe there's a repair that has to go on or your body's like repairing something and it gets crossed, right? The signals get crossed, but it can't be like the one sole cause of all of this to happen. So kind of similarly, as we talk about young people, since um, outside of like surgical options, are there any systemic or other options recommended for young skeletally immature children per se? Or do you just wait till they're 18 to start treating with these drugs? That's a good question. I have to admit, so I don't actually treat kids. So I'm probably not the right person to answer that. Um, I'd honestly have to look up if there is any data in people whose skeletons haven't matured. So basically little kids, um, but that's an excellent question. I honestly don't know the answer. 
Yeah, the only thing I know is in matinib, um, you know, we we worry like we so we've had to use it in pregnant women, for example, with a fetus who's growing and developing, and there is some concern for growth uh, impact there with a matinib. But I don't know that anybody has looked at that um, in other kids. So I would I would certainly try to avoid it unless you absolutely had no other option, and hopefully there were surgical options or at least you through symptom management we could delay. I, I've treated I've treated. Uh... Uh, not a lot, but several patients younger than 18 with surgery, uh, and and we have not tried to put anybody on uh, systemic therapy. So since you just talked, Dr. Brigman, uh, what happens when hardware fails? And this is kind of a general question, but what is there an interaction with TGCT and hardware failure, or what would cause hardware to fail? Uh, well, do you mean like a knee replacement or a hip replacement in the setting of uh, of tenosynovial giant cell tumor? Yeah, or a subtalar fusion or yeah. any of the replacements. Yeah. So um, the vast majority of patients who have hardware fail don't have tenosynovial giant cell tumor. So uh, most people are uh, most people have a knee replacement or hip replacement do fine with it, but if left long enough, sometimes they do fail. There's a variety of reasons for that. Infection is high in that list. We also see what's called aseptic loosening or loosening that's not related to infection. Um, and again, most of those patients don't have tenosynovial giant cell tumor. I think you could, uh, you could, you know, argue or you could theoretically say, well, if, if I've got a, a tenosynovial giant cell tumor and I have a knee replacement, uh, and uh, the the tumor is still active. Can the tumor eat some of the bone around the knee replacement and make it fail? Well, yeah, that could happen. Uh, um, I don't think it's a I don't think it's a common failure mechanism. And again, it can happen even if you don't have tenosynovial giant cell tumor. Thank you. That makes perfect sense. Um, so, are there other drugs that can be used to mitigate the hepatic toxicity of pexidartinib? Um, without reducing its effectiveness, similarly to how doxyrubicin has like iron chelators. Let's see. So I guess I'll start. So I, I'm not aware of a drug necessarily that will mitigate the liver toxicity of pexidartinib, but with very close monitoring, we can often catch it early. And rather than giving another drug, actually, if someone has abnormal labs will either hold the pexidartinib or lower the dose, depending on what exactly the labs are. And that alone actually is generally good enough to reverse whatever that toxicity is. Um, and then if someone can't tolerate even a lower dose, then uh, at least at this point in time, then we just wouldn't treat with pexidartinib. Dr. Wilkie, agreeance? Yeah, not much to add there. I think uh, we t we counsel people to avoid other liver toxins, so alcohol, you know, too much Tylenol, things like that. We we watch for. I had a patient who was on a cholesterol medication that actually caused a significant problem, and once we took him off the cholesterol medicine, then he could tolerate Pexy pretty well. So, you know, just looking at other things that can make the problem worse. Okay, last two questions. One being, um, is there a link to hormone receptors, particularly estrogen is often asked because um, possibly that there's an in increased amount of pregnant women in the patient support groups per se. So is there any relationship with hormones? Um, so not that I know of, at least for tenosynovial giant cell tumor, hormones certainly are related to other tumor types and other types of abnormal growths, including ones that we sort of think of as being along the same spectrum, so things like desmoid tumors and desmoid fibromatosis. But for tenosynovial giant cell tumor, um, I don't typically think of them as being hormone responsive one way or the other. I'm not aware of any relationship either. So we also wanted to ask, how do you ensure that your doctor is educated enough and aware enough of this condition to treat you? So do you have any helpful tips for patients when they go shopping for their doctors? Well, I, I think this is a real, I mean, this is a, a, a fundamental question for patients. And uh, uh, as you've seen here, um, the experiences of 
doctors like surgeons are very different than the experiences of uh, medical oncologists. And my recommendation would be to go to a place that has a team that uh, can um, can that works together. Uh, so uh, probably most of the time uh, that will be at a, a at an academic center, but not always. Uh, where uh, surgeons who are familiar with the disease work with uh, medical oncologists who have experience with the systemic treatment. Yeah, and I'll just second that. I think you know, having a team is incredibly important and then also at least some experience with the disease. So you know, very, very few physicians will see many patients with tenosynovial giant cell tumor, but uh, most of the physicians, at least at sarcoma centers, will at least have experience doing it uh, or treating uh, patients with the, with the disease. Um, and I think that's you know, probably more than anything, probably the most important thing. Yeah, you know, so one of the things that's kind of interesting is, you know, again, with the with PEXI, if you're going to prescribe pexidartinib, you have to sign up for the REMS program and not everybody, not everybody's doing that. It's quite the quite the pain to actually get through all of that and to know how to do it and that sort of thing. So I think that's one thing if you're questioning, you know, um, whether your doctor has experience, you know, you can ask, hey, does any does anyone at the institution is are you signed up for REMS or are you, do you do pexidartinib or anything like that? And usually if they're not signed up for that, then that's probably not someone who's ever used it. And you can kind of get a sense that way too. But totally second, you need a team approach, right? So even figuring out whether surgery or systemic treatment is the appropriate thing obviously takes discussion and and thoughtful, um, you know, multiple people's perspectives. Well, thank you all of you for your time, um, particularly for spending, uh, we have everyone from a different time um, zone in the United States here. So um, thank you everyone for your time. Uh, we did get a lot of questions. So we do plan to have additional webinars to answer more of those questions. Um, and you can feel free to send them to me directly and I can either follow up with some of the doctors here or we can add them to additional webinars. And so with that, um, I will say thank you to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Brigman, Wagner, and uh, Wilkie, um, and have a good evening. Thank you all. Thanks.